Um, well, I feel a little bit as if I'm the kind of arts and humanities joker here. Um, my, my background is by discipline, a historian and a linguist. Um, my interest has been, I suppose, in terms of conflict, in what we might describe as the aesthetics of contact. That's to say, the way in which... Um, already somebody's born. <laughs> the, the, the aesthetics of contact, the way in which on the ground, interveners and intervened meet, and the kind of contacts that they have. And I've worked on this in relation to the Second World War in Europe, 1940 to 45, 46, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 1995 to 2000, and more recently in the 21st um, century conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. In terms of perspective, I've just introduced where I'm coming from, so that it's easier to, uh, to, to see what I'm doing. I think my perspective has always been very influenced by what I might describe as historical ethnography. That's to say, using archival resources and oral history to attempt to bring the past and the present together and to hear the voices of the past as they were said at the time. Um, to quote the, um, the excellent Greg Denning in his book, Mr. Bly's Bad Language, it is to represent the past as it was actually experienced in such a way that we understand both its ordered and its disordered natures. In terms of ethical concern, for me, language, both the words of those I'm working with and the words I use to tell their stories, is at the root of research on conflict. Given that the conflicts that I study are all outside the UK, this necessarily involves, for me, a focus on foreign languages, languages other than my own first language, which is English. In parenthesis, I've been working more recently with um, humanitarian NGOs, and I was extremely surprised in this work to find that there seemed to be a general lack of interest in these NGOs with the fact that they were dealing with people whose first language was not their own, that many of their own contacts were in translation, they were being translated into the language of the interveners, which in this particular case that I was looking at was English and French. All stories of conflict to me are cross-cultural and that their root is language, as Sherry Simon described, every act of translation is a statement about human relations. From this standpoint then, which is the aesthetics of contact, the perspective of historical ethnography, and a strong ethical concern with language, I want to today to address nearly four points um, in this... Uh, oops. Um, the nature of archives, what I call growing your own archive, pathways of analysis, and ethics in the archive. First of all, the nature of archives. I'm conscious at the outset that the word archive will mean different things to different researchers. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm using archives as a shorthand for any constituted resources. They might be constituted by institutions, or indeed constituted by us as researchers. They might be national, local archives, they might be museum holdings, art galleries, institutional papers, emails of relevant organisations. They may be a corpus of interviews which the researcher herself has brought together. I think the heritage of Foucault and Derrida has of course made us see any such holdings as forms or symbols of power. The existence, the physical, spatial being of archives and their internal arrangements, the way they're catalogued and presented, are indicative of particular interpretations of specific forms of power. These power relations are manifested, of course, in the selection of what goes into them in the first place, and in the way in which they are arranged and presented so that people outside can actually have access to them. And I want to address those two points, if I might, selection and arrangement. Um, what goes into them, the selection? I recently, and I'm going to kind of anecdotally talk about what I've been doing en route um, as examples. I've recently been exploring the visual framing of the interpreter in conflict situations. I've been working on photographs of conflict and interpreters' presence in conflict in the Imperial War Museum in London. The Imperial War Museum has received and continues to receive all the time a vast number of soldiers' photos. That's photos which soldiers themselves have taken in war. And then they put them in an album, put them on the casa, put them on the internet, and then they, all their families, have then passed them on to the museum. 
On the whole, I think it's fair to say that the Imperial Museum has not tended to regard soldiers' photos, that's photos taken by soldiers themselves, as being of real informational or historical value. The normal process, as I understand it, has been for the museum to sift through the albums to see whether any of the soldiers' photos are illustrative of the particular things that the museum might be interested in at the time. So it might be military engagements, hardware, prisoners of war camps. And then copy, they then copy the photos that they've selected and put them into the museum's archives. The original photos and the context in which the photos were donated, the original albums, are stored away. Um, if they're physical albums, then they're stored away at the Imperial War Museum's exile site in Duxford. If they are um, online, then they are very seldom accessible to researchers. Janine Strzok, who's been researching a very interesting project she calls Private Pictures, Soldiers Inside View of War, observed that when she asked at the Imperial War Museum to see the original soldiers' albums, museum staff reacted with surprise and indeed suspicion. My request to gain access and study would be to the incredulity upgraded for asking to see too many of them. My competence as a researcher was question. What can I hope to accomplish by studying so many photographs? Now, this is not to suggest that the Imperial War Museum is unwelcoming in any way, quite the reverse in my own experience. Rather, it points to the implicit power relationships involved in selecting material for the archive and choosing what gets into it in the first place. The same internal selection, of course, operates at an earlier stage in the way in which the material is actually collected. For example, in holdings of oral history. Um, the museum has an immensely impressive sound archive collection which they're constantly adding conflict after conflict which aims, as you see, to record detailed personal reactions, uh, help us to understand the impact of war. They're, they're interviewing all the time. It's a very interesting archive. When I was in a research group working on languages in the Second World War, we found in this archive a large number of interviews with soldiers who had, when we listened to them, clearly operated as language intermediaries. Their job was obviously to be interpreters. The tendency in the recordings, however, was for the interpreters, for the interviewer, to probe issues which were considered to be more relevant than interpreting to the actual interviewer. So questions around the general military tasks or what it was like to be in Germany at that time. In 2009, however, when we contacted some of these same interviewees, some of these survivors, and said we wanted to talk to them specifically about their language experiences, they recalled foreign languages as a key part of their war experience, part of, of Alastair Thompson's feedback loop, uh, composure, uh, Penny Summerfield's feedback loop. In other words, the way in which the museum had originally collected their documents conditioned their content just indeed as our own interviews, now presented to the Imperial War Museum's collection, did in 2009. So there's a power nexus, obviously, in terms of the selection. The second manifestation of power relations as regards the archive is in presentation and cataloguing, the means by which we get access. This is the outward facing question. How are archives presented in order for us to research them? As part of this research group on languages, I, gained, uh, I worked a great deal in the British National Archives in Kew. As you'd expect, the archives have a truly gargantuan amount of material on the Second World War, gargantuan. I approached this mountain of documentation specifically looking for the role which foreign languages, which translation and interpreting played in contacts on the ground between military and civilians all over Europe. I think it is not unfair to suggest that the implicit interpretation, the implicit historiography in the West about languages and conflict has been that wars and conflicts are usually fought in the language of the archives themselves, in the language of the observing historian, in the language of the curator or commentator, i.e. in this case English. That if you like, our allies and enemies obligingly conducted our conflicts in our language rather than in theirs. Looking at the National Archives catalogue, I have found in fact fewer than 170 references to translator and interpreter. The largest of these, incidentally, were of captured enemy documents. So these concern translators and interpreters who'd worked for the enemy. About 60% of the collection consisted of memoranda and debriefings of Hitler's 
um, main interpreter, Paul Otto Schmidt. This catalog positioning of translative interpreting as something axiomatically concerned with foreignness, that of the enemy, is, I think, repeated in the next largest catalogue entries for interpreters and translators, um, which are those of the, social, the security services. Now, from these files on captured enemy interpreters, the category of language intermediary, as you can see from this, emerges as marginal, unreliable, and potentially disloyal. Now, these are not, these are actually catalogue entries. This is what the catalogue says to you. The formal designation of the translator interpreter in the National Archives catalogue frames interpreters and translators as outsiders, as marginal figures, people who provoke intense suspicion on the part of the authorities. This archival eccentricity, if you like, not only operates in relation to language intermediaries as individuals, there are approximately 350 catalogue entries for languages. And here, languages refers to material written in a foreign language, so there might be decrypts of German cipher messages, the foreign language press in the USA, foreign language journals of exile groups in London, pamphlets dropped by the Royal Air Force. What seems to be the case, I'm suggesting, is that in the architecture of the archives, the foreign is insulated away in a separate dustbin category, a bit like the traditional bookshop classification of literature not written by Anglophones, which is international. In the catalogue, individual foreignness is positioned as a cause for considerable suspicion. So what I'm arguing is there is necessarily in any archival work including the archives that we ourselves set up, which I'll talk about in a moment, a set of power relations in selection and in presentation and arrangement. But I think there is a however in this too. If the archive stands as a consciously constructed site, a site of power relations, it is also one which is radically marked by contingency as much as by power, by what one might see as the missingness the serendipity of our planet. Caroline Stedman, in I think her excellent book on archives, which she tellingly calls dust, argues that the archive is made from selected and consciously chosen documentation from the past, and also from the mad fragmentations that no one intended to preserve and that just ended up there. Institutional archives, in my experience, generally preserve things like lists, ledgers, material recording the detail of institutional power, rather than the pre- or post-narrative. This rather poor style is the detail about what turns out to be an interpreter's pool, in this world, also the pool that was set up specially to provide interpreters and translators in the occupation of Germany. Now, there's no narrative around there, there's no explanation as to how this policy uh, came into being, but the detail is there. Sometimes, of course, even the lists are so potentially sensitive to the institution that they've disappeared. There used to be a category in the National Archives called retained by department, which means basically you'll never get to see them. Shredded, deleted, or altered. The US government's Freedom of Information Act reviewers have, I'm told, produced four different versions of the same State Department records on the Rwanda genocide over a 12-year period, releasing different information each time. So documents are released and then brought back and changed slightly, and bits of redacted, as we call it. This serendipity, this what um, Stephen calls mad fragmentation, is as true, of course, of collections of personal papers as of nationally constituted archives. I once spent days and days looking through the private papers of one of the directors of the BBC World Service, trying to gauge the influence of the foreign office in framing reporting of one particular aspect of conflict. The files were abundant. Um, there were exchanges of memos within the BBC, correspondence between the director's office and the foreign office, <coughs> drafts of a history that the ex-director had been intending to write. And then falling out of the files, in between the memos, in between the official correspondence, were invitations to balls at the Army and Navy Club, handwritten thank you letters from members of the public who visited his office, 
notes from an architect about changes to his private house. Very, very odd. An odd, odd collection. Why some things were preserved and why not others is not always easy to say. I think it's important to bear in mind at the outset the limitations of archives, to see archives as both consciously constructed powerhouses established through selection, presented with a particular architecture, but also as contingent sites of mad fragmentation marked by missingness and serendipity. This approach glories, I think, in the potential of archives as sources, but applies a wholly necessary and healthy disrespect to them. I think it's a disrespect that extends just as much to us as researchers who use the archive. Traditionally, I've been brought up as a historian to believe that my credibility as a historian depends on my apparatus of footnotes, my explicit and professional references to particular archives, FO371, WO219, <laughs> apparatus. The traditional historical narrative is that what I, as a historian, am saying is right, because that is what the documents say, that is what the documents in the archives contain. As Stedman elegantly observes, however, what is really happening in my apparatus of footnotes is an assertion of my own journey as a researcher. This is my report back from the archive front. My authority in dealing with the archive really comes, as she says, I quote her, from having been there, the train to the distant city, the call number, the bundle opened, the dust. In other words, my authority as a researcher in the archive is as contingent, is, is as contingent and open-ended as the archives themselves. So that really is what I wanted to say about the nature of archives. I want to move on now to growing your own archive. I remember Richard Aldrich, um, an academic who has the great misfortune of working on the intelligence services in the war and conflict, an area in which there, are, there is precious little documentation and in which very few people are willing to talk. Aldrich suggested that the only approach was to grow your own. Researchers have to be involved in what he called an organic process of growing their own records. And this, of course, is what in practical terms most of us actually do. I find in growing my own archive three guiding, what I would call, I think, expectations. Three guiding principles which I expect to see in my research, in my grown archive. E eclecticism, internal transversality, and an honest reflection that the research journey itself is an intrinsic part of the archive. The expectation of eclecticism, I would expect in my archive to see a mixture of types and sorts of material, with no inherent suggestion of a hierarchy of evidential value. Now, that's not a view that a lot of historians, for example, would accept, but that's my view. My second expectation is one of transversality, an expectation that by putting different types of documentation side by side, you will initiate a sort of internal dialogue between them, that new links, disruptive borders, can become clearer. Placing different sorts of documents side by side, you'll see links that you might not have seen otherwise. And thirdly, honest reflection, including within the archive itself, the impressions of visits made of the intellectual journey, if you like, the notebook of the research odyssey. So, eclecticism, transversality, and reflection. None of this is particularly new. Recently, I've been working on an interdisciplinary project called the Liberal Way of War, about the ways in which liberal democracies wage war, and particularly how they represent and understand their own forms of violence. My own interest is not in the most egregious forms of violence associated with liberal democracies at war, like torture, bombing of civilians, but rather my interest has been in what I call the underside of occupation, the invisible violences every day, which take place in any contact zone when an intervening force, army, NGO, occupies an area physically 
the effect of the physical presence of interveners in constituting a contact zone. This might include traffic accidents, the development of a, a sort of frontier town morality among those who intervene, a lack of restraint in personal behaviour and engagement with the local environment, a problematic interpretation of fraternisation and sexual consent. Now, in this work, I wanted to look at these invisible violences in three different situations to see whether there were certain themes, certain types of violence which recurred across time, no matter what the type of intervention or its ostensible mission. I looked at 44, 46, because this was a vast conscript large male army which crossed continental Europe to liberate and occupy. I looked at 95 2000 and Bosnia and Herzegovina, where a small professional army, which now contained women, was engaged in a UN, NATO, peacekeeping, peacebuilding mission, so a very different sort of mission. And I finally looked at the more recent deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, where liberal democracies were waging a war of counterinsurgency. Um, in terms of growing an archive, this is your um, well, I hastily put together, but this is more or less what happened. So, eclecticism, um, I attempted to get written material from both interveners and intervened. Now, this became, as you'll see there, I think, much more difficult for me with Iraq and Afghanistan. So, you can see there's a kind of thinning of certain sorts of material. I looked at newspapers, there are interviews, some of them are historic, some of them are newly done much more difficult to do, I found, first-hand interviews in Iraq and Afghanistan, so um, those were second-hand. <coughs> there are photographs there, there are maps. I looked also at creative writing. There are some extremely interesting novels written in all three of these periods about the experience of interveners and intervened. And um, I found a lot of really very interesting material in exhibitions. There was a very interesting material um, an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum on um, material culture which soldiers who had been operating in Afghanistan brought back and gave the museum and then commented on it. In terms of, of transversality, so if you put this sort of document together and you try to create a dialogue between them, I find what was particularly suggestive about having these different types of documentation was the view that it gave me personally of Occupation. What does occupation mean? You have reports at the time. Um, I found in, in archives listings, lists of are very big in archives, lists of occupied buildings. So in one particular town, um, the army were occupying 17 factories, 41 garages, five cinemas, four dance halls, three barracks, two hospitals, 68 hotels, went on and on. Uh, Stade Municipal, Municipal Music Conservatory, Public Gardens, six of the major arterial roads. I put that next to local newspapers and the kind of complaints that they made. And, and a, a very interesting continuing complaint in this was about the control of roads and the occupation of roads by vehicles which were, because they were normally army or NGO vehicles, meant that the drivers in them were very safe, but the way that they were driven put the lives of those around them, the civilians, if you like, the ordinary people, in grave danger. I was particularly interested in photographs, and this is by no means um, myself, of British bases across engagements. This is a British base in, in Germany. It's been, they've taken over um, uh, a German shop. They've, been, they've re signposted it, more of that later. Um, yeah. This is the sort of thing that's put up at the entrance. Um, this is a photograph, not a very good one, sorry, about the, the quality of that, about what a British base looked like in, in, in Afghanistan. I looked at the maps as well, and what I found very interesting about these maps was to trace maps of town centres, to trace the occupation, successive occupations, if you like, in these towns. In particular, the Second World War, it was clear in some of the maps that I looked at that the German occupation of buildings in a particular town centre had then been replaced by an American occupation of exactly the same building. So one building went um, used for different purposes. Um, I find the novels, particularly um, 
and the all novels actually tell you. Extremely interesting on this idea of occupation. <coughs> Finally, reflection on research journeys, and I've talked about eclecticism and transversality. Reflection on the research journey. What I think I became more and more aware of in looking at this range of material was the persistence of what Mary Louise Pratt calls the power of naming, the moral implications of naming and therefore possessing space. So departmental roads in the Second World War were renamed as the Green Diamond Highway, the Red Diamond Highway, the Sherbourne San Luis Gold Highways. Antrofor in Bosnia and Herzegovina nailed notices every two or three kilometres on roads naming the Route Triangle. In Baghdad, in Iraq, in the Green Zone, the entrance was changed from its original name, Palace Gate, to Assassin's Gate by the Americans. And then there was the informal naming of places by soldiers and sounds, which, which was a thread throughout all this work. It came out particularly in interviews. Local civilians in Bosnia Herzegovina told us, I quote, if you ask the Antrofor soldier, do you know where Gordon Yvakov is? He wouldn't know. But if you ask the soldier, do you know where GV is? He says, oh yes, GV. So, what I'm arguing about here is archivally, eclecticism, transversality, and personal reflection um, in this growing your own archive, which is what I did. I quickly want to move on to my third part, which is pathways of analysis. In practice, how do you work your way through this self-drained archive? Now, obviously, this depends on your disciplinary perspective. My own approach of historical ethnography um, has suggested two very broad perspectives on the material to be of use in research and what I'm interested in, which is this aesthetics of contact in conflict situations. One is performance, and the other one is narrative cartography. So if I can take each of those. First of all, performance following the processes. Um, I became interested um, in the work I was doing in the recent cultural turn in the military. That's to say the idea first promulgated by the now disgraced ex-director of the CIA, David Petraeus, that winning hearts and minds, so-called non-kinetic warfare, is critical to military engagements. I was particularly keen to see how this cultural term positioned foreign languages, what policy did the military adopt to win hearts and minds in terms of language, how do they influence people, um, and how do they see language as part of that. Attempts to discover a language policy through the evidence of written texts or oral interviews proved difficult. The British Ministry of Defence um, has a, a very long joint doctrine note on culture and military. It's got 508 paragraphs, I think. Only three of these mention foreign languages. And these position foreign languages in what I think many of us would feel is a bit of an epistemological concept. You know, well, culture and language are linked, but on the whole, uh, language capability is a bit of a specialisation. So that didn't help me very much. Interviewing the Lieutenant Colonel in charge of language policy for the UK services, which I did, produced for me an excellent understanding of the structure within the UK military to provide language capacity. There are clear NATO standard definitions of language competence at various levels. He could show me an interesting table of pros and cons for and against employing different types of personnel as linguists. So, military, military reserves, MOD civilians, contractors, locally employed civilians. So, you know, it, it was a very clear structure. It was a very clear table. However, none of this, neither that nor interviewing the Lieutenant Colonel, actually helped me to understand what happened in practice on the ground. For example, I knew that when the British went into Bosnia Herzegovina in 1995, the army could only find two officers who had actually encountered the Serbic languages at university. So one would have to argue radically unprepared. In the end, I found myself pursuing more conventional conceptions of policy formation and instead adopting Bruno Latour's approach of following the processes through which power is made up, through which it's performed, through which it's exercised, Latour's following the actors, flattening the landscape, as Latour calls it, seeing that there is no necessary hierarchy between the macro and the micro, 
that the command and control centre of an army <coughs> is no bigger and wider than the local front line. Both are local landscapes whose topographies and connections can be studied in the same way, and the vocabulary of the actors heard loud and clear. In practice, this meant focusing on meetings on the ground and seeing how spaces for communication were constituted, listening carefully to the manner of their constitution. What we heard when we did this were the voices of local civilians, often high school students, often women, who had suddenly been called upon, usually radically underprepared, to interpret for British Army personnel. I quote one interview with an 18-year-old hired as an interpreter in Bosnia Herzegovina, talking about her colleagues. I quote, some of them were studying English, the others didn't, I can't remember now. I know for two, these two who were working at the command level, they were English students, I know that for sure, the others were not. The others were kids like me, like common kids, youngsters who were able to pick up some English, who were able to learn English in high school. They weren't trained really, I wasn't trained. I had to do it myself. I'm not trained to be an interpreter. I'm just, you know, this probably wouldn't be my career if there was no war. Definitely not. See, my argument is, I think, that by following the actors, we found a language policy for peace deployment, which was actually being constituted, performed on the ground itself. The second perspective that I found useful is what I call narrative cartography. Narrative, from coding genealogical research has encouraged us, as uh, Tambuco suggests, to remain on the surface of narrative analysis, to create a map of how different stories connect with other stories, discourses and practices in shaping meanings. In a way, this is, um, carries on, doesn't it, from the archival transversality I mentioned. In my work on the Second World War, I had started off expecting to be telling stories and encounters on the ground of conflict, of verbal meetings, of exchanges of communication. Across the surface of the material, however, I found not meetings between interveners and interveners and intervened, not verbal communication, but rather a category of spaces between, of physical detachment. The military were often located up in tanks, in armoured cars, looking down. The liberated, the intervened, was staring up. There was a, a very different positionality. There seemed, if you like, to me, to be a narrative thread, a narrative cartography, linking these stories. One of space apart, one of separation. So, in terms of analysing my archive, I've looked at performance and at narrative cartographies. And finally, briefly, I'd like to, to address what I call ethics and the archive, the ethical considerations. What are the ethics involved for me in these archives and pathways of analysis? I think there's two principal areas of concern. There are ethical concerns external to the material, and there are secondly ethical concerns internal to the material itself. How we approach the material, and then how we write it up, how we share it with others. It's basic, of course, in external terms, to respect the formal conditions set by the owners of the archives, respect for the regulations imposed by the archives, the terms in which the archives are given to you. Um, at the moment, I, I'm, um, for the work on, on the visualisation of the interpreter, I'm negotiating for photographs with the Imperial War Museum, but also with the estate of um, an artist who was a prisoner of war, who very unusually and surprisingly drew pictures of interpreters, so I have to respect the, the estate, and I have to ask the estate for permission to use this and to analyse it. Oral documents, I know Paul is going to talk a lot more on this, on the problematics of enabling ethics, but the terms of the contracts made with interviewees, first of all the terms made by others, if you're using oral history archives, but of course often by us and what kind of contracts they are. I think it's basic as well in this sense of external ethics to respect the relationship that our archive will have with future readers or hearers of the research material, the recognition that the research is open-ended, that this is all part of an ongoing train or debate, hence clearly leaving trails and markers, footnotes, which others can follow in making their own cartography. 
I think all that is, is the, the problematization, but perhaps, you know, if I can leave that aside for a moment and look at what for me is more problematic, which is the ethics internal to the material. Ethics involved in respecting the material and in communicating the material to others. A great deal of my own archive, as I've suggested, is written or spoken in a foreign language, a language other than my own first language. It's particularly interesting to me that much of the secondary material on narrative research has tended to show a fairly cursory or non-existent attention to language. This lack of attention to language is, let me be very clear about this, in my view, unethical. It is fundamental, in my view, to be aware of the original languages used, to address their presence overtly during the actual research process, and to integrate their presence within the methodological and analytical procedures used. Awareness, overt addressing, and integration of language. In practice, of course, this can be both time-consuming and partial. Many years ago, I was involved in a project about women in the European Parliament over 12 countries. To interview these women, we operated in a multilingual team so that the women were always interviewed by someone who spoke their first language as uh, their own first language. The book from the research, however, was going to be in English. So we had to agree together as a team how each abstract we were going to use would be translated. And this involved going back to the women concerned to check on whether they accepted our rendering, our translation. In the book, and we weren't entirely successful in this, I think it would have to be said, we felt three things very strongly, that we should indicate what we have done, the linguistic methodology, if you like, that our interviewees understood what we were doing, going to do as regards linguistic transfer, and thirdly, that our interviewers and translators, interpreters, were clearly credited in the book. So we felt that, ethically, the presence of foreign languages should be integrated within the methodology and should be integrated within the final product of the research, in this case of the book. As I said, looking back on this book and, 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 and skimming it briefly before I wrote this, I realised that this was extremely partial as a result. But any research which engages with people whose first language is not the language of the interviewer must, in my opinion, recognise the fact, address the importance and implications of it, and integrate the presence of foreign languages within the research. There is, though, perhaps a broader issue here, too. In sharing the results of research with others, by publication, by paper, on the internet, I think there are major ethical concerns, too. I believe we need to have a system of respect for the words themselves, wherever they come from, documents where they come from interviews, a faithful rendering in our writing of the original, actual words, whatever language they are in, the original English, the translated English, incidentally signaled that it is translated. This conscientious attention to the language itself, the ways in which people choose to express themselves, means, and I recognise this, that I am an obsessive and lengthy quota. I have a lot of time for um, the novelist Kate Atkinson, who said in, her, in her, one of her early books, Behind the Scenes at the Museum, it is only words that can construct a world that makes sense. I, uh, I quote at length and as accurately as I can the words of those um, that I have read or spoken with. I may say, though, that this lengthy quoting approach falls foul of all sorts of things. First of all, it can fall foul of publishers. Um, I, I was um, working in, in a group that was preparing a book on Bosnia Herzegovina, and um, we were particularly keen that the words of those concerned should figure very broadly and, wide and clearly in the book. The peer reviewers would be publication, and indeed the publishers, argued that we needed to cut these quotations very considerably. So although there are, there are chapters in that book that talk about the voices of interpreters, the voices of civilians, um, in fact the original um, approach that we had was, was fairly strongly doctored. It can also, of course, fall foul of critics. 
if I approach a criticism of one of my own books, I've just checked that the particular reviewer is not here today. Um, the, the idea behind this book is interesting and challenging. It's always, it's always a warning if the word challenging is used in a review. Um, looking not at the process of liberation, but at the relationships, using contemporary narratives. As such, it ignores later memoirs and other writings tainted by hindsight, concentrates entirely on comment and reflection written at the time. This will be a useful book, providing that readers clearly understand the premise behind the author's approach to her subject. So he, so he didn't really think much of this. He thought there was much too much quotation, much too much of, of the contemporary. I continue, despite all that, <laughs> to believe that attention and linguistic respect are key ethical drivers. It is clear, though, that we have to practice some self-reflexivity about the limits of this respect and attention. By selecting and quoting words, albeit as faithfully as possible, we are, of course, taking them out of context and putting them in a new one constructed by us as researchers. Tambuco has an image I much like for this. Your own interpretation becomes like a kind of a lighthouse whose rotating light illuminates certain things at the expense of others. What Jeanette Winterson describes as lit up moments and the rest is dark. When we write our research, we are, in Foucault's words, in translation, which is up here, I may say fictional. Um, Foucault argues I've never written anything but 